welcome back to another episode of Health Matters. The topic for today is mental health management during palliative care. And to talk about that, we have an expert in that field. She has been experienced for over 20 years in palliative care. Her name is Dr. Manisha Singh. So if you're interested in finding out about how mental health needs to be managed during palliative care, tune in. Come on, let's check it out. Uh, so ma'am, the first question that we have is, why communication is important and what role does it play during palliative care? Uh, as you know, what is communication? Communication is basically uh, giving messages to each other or we can say exchanging the ideas. This is what a communication is. Now, whenever a patient is affected by any serious illness, communication about his health, about his future, about what will be happening to his family, this all becomes very important. Especially in palliative care, when patient is suffering from any life-limiting illness, uh, there are majorly three things which they want from us. Their symptom management, whatever symptoms they are suffering from, we need to treat them. Secondly, a very clear communication they are expecting from us and very honest communication. So whatever is happening to them, whatever is right now their situation and what will be the future of this condition, what they are having. So they want a very clear communication from us. And that's why communication becomes a very essential part in palliative care. Apart from this, when we communicate with them, we are able to know what's going behind their mind, what's there in their heart. When, whenever a patient is in uh, his last stages of life, there are certain questions which he is facing, which he is not telling anybody. So when we communicate with these patients, we get to know a lot many things about them, their dreams, uh, their hopes, what they were thinking. Uh, we usually provide a psychological support also. Uh, when we know that they are in depression or when they are in denial of their disease or their prognosis. So, apart from uh, palliation of symptoms, these two things depend fully on the, the way you communicate with the patient. That is, what would be his prognosis and giving him psychological support to it. I'm not taking him as a patient. You know, he is a person who had certain dreams with him, who had a family with him. He, he must be a brother or sister, a doctor. Uh, he must be having kids. So, you know, he is a full full spectrum, a full uh, system sitting in front of me. It's not only the patient and the disease. And when I am communicating him the prognosis, which is not very good, I need to be very careful the way I tell him. I can't give him hope and I can't take away hope. I have to balance. And so there, there is... There are a lot of maybes when I communicate with him. Sometimes when we can't afford, we can't offer him any treatment, uh, the central part of treatment sometimes remains only psychological aspect and that is treated by communication. So, in my view, when we communicate with the patient, it requires greater thought and planning than only prescribing medicine. And unfortunately, it is commonly administered in very sub-therapeutic ways. The communication which we do, we are not trained for doing that. As a physician, in our curriculum, we don't have communication as a chapter. So we don't have that human touch with the patient when it's required. We are looking at him in terms of only disease and symptoms, not as a person. So we have to treat him very humanly as far as the palliative care is concerned. Uh, whatever you said, it is so difficult to handle when the patient is actually sitting in front of you. I mean, I cannot imagine. So that actually brings me to my second question that then what are the communication strategies that you have created over all these years to have an effective as well as a continuous communication during the entire palliative care treatment? When comes to me, and when I have to break the bad news, this is a very big line, breaking the bad news. And patient is sitting in front of me and I have to tell him, sorry, our treatment has failed. And now we don't have anything to offer to you. And this line should never be spoken to the patient. We always have something to offer to him as a palliative care physician. 
usually medical oncologists radiation oncologists they are very busy because they are looking after mainly curative parts but once they think that uh, nothing is working for them then we come into the picture and then we need to communicate this to these patients that uh, we are we are left with very less option and when the patient hears this sometime it happens that uh, they are like into so much of intense emotions they can't speak a word but as you know we say silence is golden but here silence is not golden because whatever may be the situation on hearing this line the background questions what they are having in this their mind is now so how long do i have and how will i die these two things are continuously going in their mind and if we wait for the patient to speak up or say something during that time when he is not able to speak up hearing this news it's like we are missing the opportunity to addressing his concern so we need to explore him what is what is going in his mind we need to ask him provo- provocatively that what are you thinking uh, what are you hoping for what are your worst fears these are the line we start with we don't go and straight away tell him that this is this is your report and you can't do anything and so you know we have to be very gentle in breaking this news there are very various strategies which we follow as a protocol there is a class strategy these are acronyms and then there is a spike strategy i'll i'll just explain you a little bit what is what are these strategies actually when patient comes and sits in front of us initially what we need to do is we have to connect with him the basic uh, foundational component of effective communication is to connect or engage with that person like we need to understand what the patient is experiencing right now and what if we are in their position and if somebody tells us this line that uh, this is going to happen now or your reports are saying this so what would how would we react or how would we behave we have to feel that person's emotion at that time and also that what are you hoping for now what your concern when we tell the patient this thing their main concern is what will happen to my family how will the finances be managed if they are having small kids they have concerns of kids also and then you know he he is a person he must be having some dreams he must have thought of something about future buying a house buying a buying a car buying, buying having a dream job so you know suddenly we are we are stopping all this thing in this mind we are pulling that string out and everything is lost for him in, at that particular moment so we need to understand this we just can't can't think that okay as a physician my my duty is to tell him the truth because i have taken hippocratic oath i have to be ethical and i have to tell him honestly what is it but that doesn't work every time we, we will be telling them but then there is a certain way so communication is very important when this uh, point is there but that doesn't mean like if i am concerned about my patient's emotions that doesn't mean that i have to take ownership of everything you know symptom control is okay effectively communicating what is going to happen is okay supporting him during all this time till his last breath we are doing but then that doesn't mean that we own the sadness the unfair uh, unfairness feeling with the patient has ki why this happened to me this is very unfair so this sadness the very fact that this person is dying the feeling which this this feeling the physician has to disconnect it then only he'll be able to provide patient the support he needs basically uh, the strategy is known as spikes uh, spike mein, the acronym s is setting the stage or setting the uh, how will tell like if i'm i'm going in a corridor and a patient comes in shows me his report and it's showing that it has metastasized this tumor has gone to brain or liver anywhere i'll not tell him then and there in that corridor i need to have a certain setting we have certain rules like how that setting should be i'll tell him that in person i'll call him in my room i'll i'll not be distracted the most distracting thing right now in our society is mobile phone i need to keep that mobile phone away i if i'm working on my computer or my screen 
if i am working on this screen i will not talk to my patient and if i am talking to patient i will not look at this screen there has to be eye contact with the patient preferably if i am sitting across the table if i go and sit up with him in front of him around two feet that would give him the confidence that i am with him uh, instead of me sitting this side of the table and he sitting in that other side i have to minimize the distraction and then if possible any friend or any family member if want to be there during this discussion they are invited so and when this is done there come then again comes the non verbal part of the communication that is your body language even if i am in hurry i have 10 patients sitting outside i'll never let him realize this that i don't have time for him i'll just sit there in a very relaxed manner doing eye contact with him if needed touching him sometimes giving him the assurance that we are there for him even if there are no other treatments but still will be there with him and also the most important part is introduction doing some general talks and introducing ourselves really uh, makes us connected to the patient so how should we start now uh, i'll start like i'll invite the patient first i'll ask him what he knows about his disease and whether he wants to know more it's his full right if he says no i don't want to know anything will not tell him anything about his disease but if he says that i know this this much and i want to know more what would be my future what is how is my treatment progressing and and he actually the general query is will everything will be painful so if he wants to know will tell him but there are some patients 90% of patients they want to know what will be happening some patients they don't want so we don't tell them they want their family member to know we call family member and we tell them and we explain them everything uh, what is going on with the patient so another thing is we have to see the knowledge of the patient what knowledge he is having about his disease whether it's in in alignment of what what he is thinking and what is actual medical condition is if he is thinking something else we need to clear that thing in his mind uh, as per the his reports or as per his actual diagnosis secondly uh, if he knows x level of thing whether he wants to add up to those things that is another thing then uh, coming on to the next thing is we have to be very empathetic with the patient whenever we are talking with the patient or we are telling him this news we have to identify the emotion and from that from where that emotion is coming whenever we tell the patient if they start crying another rule is if they are crying we break the eye contact at that time we look at other place because we give him time to cry and to gather up the courage again to speak up so we just leave him at that point we don't make any eye contact with him and let him uh, be relaxed after few minutes of crying or anything if he the the intense emotion which he is going through at that time we just leave him there and then after few minutes we start again and uh, when uh, we start we start speaking to him we actually need to make connection with him with that's what you call empathetic response empathy is like telling him that yes we know what you are feeling uh, sensing his emotions and giving him the uh, uh, giving him the idea that okay uh, we understand it and we are there to help you that is empathy and normally we start like i know it's very awful or this information is uh, really shocking for you we know that and we understand that we start with this line and how you start the conversation is also very important you just can't go and bluntly tell him anything so and this empathetic response is also a technique this is a skill which we can learn it's not necessary that uh, because as a physician we are never taught this okay we at certain point we stop uh, feeling empathetic because it's a routine thing for us every day exactly so we become blunt also but then with uh, these patient or with palliative care patient or any patient suffering with life limiting illness we need to have this skill and we need to be very sensitive and supportive to this patient exactly uh, then uh, then comes like during this conversation when we are done with uh, this thing and now we are we are analyzing his emotions and we are 
and you know active listening is very important there is right. one study quotes that whenever even in simple communication when you are talking to anybody uh, you know the time which we interrupt the other person uh, normally it studies tell that in within 18 seconds we interrupt the other person when he is speaking so oh. we are very bad listeners as a human being and for a palliative care physician if you want to listen if you if effective listening is a very big skill because you have to let the patient his emotions come out so it's advisable that at least you let the patient speak for 2 minutes without interrupting him and it should normally be in general communication also we should let people speak and we should mm-hmm. be a great listener also so and another thing which i told like uh, whenever we are uh, having any communication or in a ward round normally we stand as a doctor we stand and patient is on the cot and then we explain him when we do counseling but actually again a study showed that if you stand and counsel the patient he'll perceive it as a very less time you're given to him even if you stand for 10 minutes he will perceive it as very less time you have given to him but if you sit and counseling even for 3 minutes he'll perceive it as you have given him 10 minutes so there also a psychological difference comes so it's advisable whenever we are talking to a patient in any setting we just need to sit down standing and talking and telling him this important piece of information is not taken very well by the patient okay and when this thing that done when we explain him what's going to happen then we need to tell him our plan also what would be the future strategy we'll compile a plan for him symptom control is always there till the patient's last breath we are giving him all the things to make him comfortable so that his journey his last breath is very peaceful and he doesn't die in pain so that symptom control is always there so we always tell them whatever may be even if your disease progresses will not let you suffer will always there for you and the drugs or the treatment which is mainly for symptom control will always be there and will always be there for communication also we provide psychological support to patient like even in this meeting when we close this meeting when we summarize everything we tell patient to you tell us in your words now what have you understood by all this communication and when he is understood what we are trying to convey to him we even tell him that if you want to discuss anything uh, we are available for you and we even give him the next appointment also when he has to come so that we can again sit and talk because his questions are going to increase as his disease is progressing exactly so in this way we finally do the closure of that particular difficult communication which we are doing when we break all his hopes when we break all his dreams but then it's also very essential because they expect us to have that honest communication with them and tell them honestly what is going to happen yes, i'm uh, listening to this is giving me goosebumps like i cannot imagine what you know you doctors have to go through and uh, as while you were speaking uh, i just came up with another question is then how do you utilize or like decode the patient's responses like every patient has a different response like one may be completely silent as you said one may start yeah. crying out loud so how do you know how you are supposed to deal with every different type of patient yeah you know uh, some patients they take it very sportingly like at that time they will not show us any emotion but i know uh, uh, emotions would be there the those sea of emotions are always there whenever patient even try to show us that he is very composed then there are the two three terms we have there are some patients which go into denial denial is like there are many forms of denial and denial is a normal coping mechanism whenever denial is not only about illness denial is about everything in life which uh, every difficulties which we face in life and when we want to uh, keep our balance we simply deny that this thing is happening so in these patients the denial is very common and when patient give us lot many reasons whatever the rational or irrational thought they are giving for this denial uh, it's our duty to listen to them because it's their normal coping mechanism when patient comes with comes to me like i'm ha- my swelling is increasing on this stage 
So at that time, I'll tell him very softly that, you know, because your disease is progressing here, because head and neck cancers are very common in India. So when they have your huge growth here, the obstruction of the lymphatics, it causes the swelling of the eye. And so what they are thinking is simple swelling, but actually the disease is progressing. So when I need to tell them this, I need to te- I, I tell them very slowly, very softly that, okay, I think some years, this disease has progressed a little bit. And I think the swelling is because of that. So let's see what we can do for this. And I'll prescribe some drugs which he'll take and you know the way. But I've given him that information that your disease is progressing. So he has that idea somewhere that okay, this is progressing and, and this is because of this. But now he thinks that okay, I think this will be cured or this swelling will reduce. But when the next meeting will come and he'll tell me this swelling is not reducing, again I'll tell him slowly that. I think this is again progressing and this is not responding to my treatment. So let's see what we can do. So I am, uh, there is no hope for cure. But still, I'm giving him that little bit of hope he could show sakta hai because, you know, the thing is, I can't give him hope and I can't <laughs> deny him hope. So, you know, and when the patients come, the denial is so many types. So, you know, some people will try to keep it secret. They'll not tell their neighbors, they'll not tell their relatives. Even this happened in Corona thing also. It was an infect. It was a infection. But I don't know why people were keeping it secret. Initially, everybody was so afraid of telling that they are positive. So you know this type of denial is very common in this life-limiting illness also. Then there is the denial or this illusion of control that I'll go to the best doctors, I'll get the best treatments, I'll change my diet, I'll do everything. And you know this is a frantic search for their facts and treatments. Uh, which they prevent as an emotional reaction. So it's all uh, avoidance thing actually, whatever they are doing because they don't want to accept that this is happening to them. So there is very minimalizing thing also. They will very minimize things. I'll get okay. Uh, There's no problem in this. Sometimes these patients say, I just don't want to think about it. There is a point. There's no point in dwelling on this thing. So this is also a type of that. So when these patients come to us, it's really difficult for us to break their denial. Uh, but it's essential sometimes because when they miss on their appointments or they don't come for their scheduled diagnostic procedure, then uh, we need to tell them the seriousness of the condition and uh, they need to understand that they have to continue with their uh, treatment. Another thing is collusion. So what is collusion? Every day we see when we call patients inside our chamber for discussion, first a family member will come, he'll sit there, Madam, you have not told him anything. Uh, so please you don't tell him about the disease or the prognosis, anything. So okay. this is that family members are trying to prevent information reaching to the patient without even asking the patient. They don't know whether the patient would like to know it or not. So when this happens, this we call collusion. And when this happens, uh, what we do is it's okay. If family doesn't want, we don't tell the patient. Uh, but the thing is, we have to see the family's culture also, what their mm. values are. And there's no emergency of telling patient this thing. So it's okay for us if family requests us, we don't want to tell patient. But then we make the family understand that doing this is you're robbing him of those last days which he must have thought of doing something. Uh, one patient uh, came to me, uh, she was having a carcinoma breast and uh, she was like uh, uh, with a, all metastasis to brain and lungs and all. So okay. uh, she told me, she asked me directly how much time I have. Now, you know, this, uh, she was hoping that uh, I'll tell her something good. You know, hope is essential part of human experience. We hope everything for something, you know. We hope for heal- healing when there is no cure. We give this hope to the patient. We hope for comfort when there is suffering. We hope for a few more days. Like these patients hope for a few more days for some important event. So she asked me how much time I have. So I told her, uh, so why, what What do you think is going to happen and what's, what's the Oh, what is your in mind? What's in mind? She told me that my daughter is going to get married in uh, after two months. So I just want to watch that ceremony. So, you know, this was her hope. 
so i didn't want to break her hope so i we try everything so that uh, at least we can make her keep her alive till uh, her things are done you know but of course it's not in our hands also sometimes but at least we can try so uh, as a physician you know i told you we don't give hope but we don't take away hope also hmm. and so I, and it's my routine thing i ask every patients what they hope for and we get very good uh, request uh, recently i had a request from a patient uski beti ki sagai thi and four five days he was having severe mucositis you know ulcers he was not able to speak so okay. we gave him another he came every day to us we gave him a certain type of bubble last day he was so happy he was able to speak and in the evening uh, the engagement of his daughter was there so you know these are small small things these are their hopes and these are their dreams so right. we actually need to sit with them and ask so that at least whatever we can do uh, will help them doing or uh, completing their that small hope or small thing which they want in life wow this is so much <laughs> insight together <laughs> even you know the one question arises about spirituality also you know yeah i was actually thinking while you were talking about it very common why has this happened to me mai to roz puja karti thi mai to roz puja karta tha upvas karta tha then why me you know and answering this question is very difficult and we face this question every day when patients start crying their first question is why me so i tell them Even carcinoma lung patient, मैं तो स्मोक ही नहीं करता था फिर भी मुझे हुआ सो आई टेल दम इट्स वेरी अनफेयर कि आपको हुआ इवन इफ यू हैव स्मोक स्टिल इट्स वेरी अनफेयर कि आपको हुआ बट देन सटनली वी हैव टू जस्ट एम्पथाइज विद इम एट दैट पॉइंट वी कॉन्ट डू एनीथिंग वॉट कैन बी सो आई जस्ट टेल दम आई नो इट्स वेरी अनफेयर इट्स नॉट फेयर ऑन एनी बडीज पार्ट and i don't want anybody to suffer with this thing and i don't want anybody to come and sit beside me and i have to break that bad news to them i don't want anybody to come to me for that you know it's unfair on everybody's part but then this is life and we have to take as it comes so everybody has to go i we never know how we will go so if this was your way and might be hamara kuch aur hoga so you know this way when we talk to them it eases their this spiritual pain also because exactly. i just ask them are you at peace and nobody is at peace with this thing going in my my mind that today i am there tomorrow i'll be there or not i don't know so you know uh, asking to them to be peaceful asking them to be happy uh, you know it's all things to say but i know it's very difficult on their part to do all these things exactly so uh, the next question that we had i think you've already answered it the question was the best way i'm so passionate about my subject when it comes i i just go yeah <laughs> no but I've, we've gotten so many insights like i haven't thought in that way or you know you've given so many examples from your experiences that we right now we have a vast knowledge on how communi- how important communication is to all it's of these patients and these patients you know because uh, it's not about patient it's about everybody related to him so exactly. even if caregivers are you know like if a patient survive if a patient is there for 2 years the caregivers depression anxiety is another issue exactly. you know every day think you have to prepare their trial tube feed you every 2 hours you have to give that feed you have to do this big dressings every day patient can't get up they are so weak and caring for those patients caregivers also need a break so they we provide need. respite care also for these uh, caregivers like sometimes they are totally cut off socially also but they don't attend any uh, function any marriages because where they will leave this patient so uh, <laughs> not a vacation so is uh, already out of question for this so we offer them we have a hospice here in amdabad so we offer them if they want to take break from caring of the patient they can uh, admit the patient to our hospice go for a four five days 10 days whatever they want rejuvenate go for a vacation or any marriage function or anything and then come back and again start taking care of the patient so they also feel good 
otherwise yeah. Yeah. caregivers depression is also a major problem you know sometimes they are they are so tired like they start thinking yaar ki khatam ho sab kuch this mm-hmm. is the thinking mm-hmm. now then they start having and it's it's not wrong on their part also because when we see 24 hours caring for a patient it's very difficult it's very difficult at home so we can't blame caregivers also whether it's a wife or son or daughter they also need break and you know the family are financially also they are uh, very much uh, uh, depleted then mm. the cancer mm. attacks in the home the family is depleted in all the areas like socially they are gone financially they are gone the future wise the kids you know many females now i've started working on this thing also many females after the death of husband they come uh, they need work how will they survive financially now they have small kids so uh, i can't say everybody to go and be maid and do jhadu pocha in the house so uh, i am trying to get some some people on board so that we can give them some vocational training and they can do something to earn their livelihood respectfully at least so this is also a major issue like emi stay uh, one was a driver he had his uber car he has taken on loan the emi the car, bank confiscated that because he was not able to drive that car for 6 months because of disease so car gone uh, they were on rent so the मकान मालिक एवरी डे यूज टू कम रेंट 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 देन शी डेंट हैव एनी थिंग इवन शी टोल्ड मी दैट टू ब्रिंग हिम टू हॉस्पिटल शी यूज टू डू अ टैक्सी ऑटो फॉर थ्री हंड्रेड रुपीज एंड देट वेर ऑल्सो गिवन बाय द नेबर्स बिकॉज शी डेंट हैव एनी एनी थिंग फ्रॉम टू अर्न सो यू नो स्मॉल हंड्रेड रुपीज टू हंड्रेड रुपीज आर सो इम्पॉर्टेंट फॉर दिस पेशेंट sometimes i one patient a old female she walked in the heat of this amdabad in the summer time almost 5 kilometers because she was not able to afford the uh, auto oh, so while oh, going oh, back oh. i gave her money and i told her now you go by auto because she was very aged and oh, she oh. she wouldn't be able to tolerate this uh, heat and she was suffering from some head and neck cancer only so you oh, know yes. small things are so important for these people uh, which we really we we take for granted actually we take our life for granted we so do when do. i talk to this patient i am filled with gratitude i thank god every day that we are at least he has given me this uh, power to help these patients mm. so i am mm. i am making little bit of difference in their life at least when they are dying uh, i have completely covered all the questions and you have given us a lot of information today was very informative and i am overwhelmed listening to all of these experiences at least now you are you are enlightened what is palliative yes. care and how how we are doing it and i want everybody to know this you know so that and nobody is upset exactly so i hope this this uh, program of yours uh, help us in uh spreading this awareness about palliative care and end of life care and how we are doing it definitely we are all working towards that the group of health sarthi and all and this is something even i did not know i saw your video with maitri on health sarthi itself that's when i came to know what it is about and that's when i was more intuitive and i wanted to talk to you and today was a very great session thank you so much for your time i know you're very busy you've just said that you came directly home and you sat yeah, the- from hospital so thank you thank you very much hi guys if you enjoyed the discussion don't forget to like share and subscribe also turn on the bell notifications and comment down any questions related to health and wellness and we will try to answer it in our next episode